Well, good evening. Uh, you see my sign says May 19th. Actually, uh, this is the Bible study for May the 20th. Sorry that I got my dates confused there, but thank you so much for being a part of tonight's Bible study. And I pray that the Lord will, will bless you. Uh, this is the Wednesday before we actually kick off our back to church, reopening the church. Uh, and we will reopen this coming Sunday uh, just for a morning worship service. Uh, it will, there will be no Sunday school, there will be no nursery, no children's activity, no youth. And uh, we just uh, play, pray that you'll come and join us if, uh, if you're comfortable in doing that. We'll continue to air our uh, services just as we have been doing. And uh, so we're going to try to figure out this new normal as we move along and hope that you'll come and be with us. A couple of things that we will ask of you as you come and join us for a worship time. Uh, we will ask of you that you help us to practice social distancing. We're going to try to keep six feet apart uh, as far as families and the groups now. If your family lives in the same household, uh, you are more than welcome to sit together. Uh, but other families, we're going to ask you to keep about uh, six foot of distance uh, between them. We will have rows marked so that uh, one service will sit on one group of rows, like the even-numbered rows. And the second service will sit on the odd-numbered rows so that we're not contaminating and all those sorts of things. Uh, we talked today about our singing, and uh, it was brought to our attention that some worry about uh, the singing and the things that we uh, broadcast into the air, and so we're going to ask people to remain seated uh, during our singing time. I uh, want to point out to you that our restrooms will be open, and we do have plans to sanitize those in between our services uh, but really, one of the things you can do and, and help us greatly, we really anticipate our service not to be more than 45 minutes long. We're going to work hard in keeping it a very brief service. And so if you could take care of all the restroom activity that, uh, that you may uh, feel you will need before you get to our church, we would appreciate that tremendously. Uh, but I want to stress to you, the restrooms will be open. Uh, and we will sanitize them in between services. Uh, but if you, you really could help us by taking care of all those things before you arrive. Well, tonight we want to study uh, Psalm 3. Two weeks ago we looked at Psalm 1. Last week we looked at Psalm 2. I told you as we study, started the study of the book of Psalms that we were not going to look at every psalm. And I know we did one, now two, then three. And it seems like we're going to do every psalm. But uh, psalm number three, and this is the way God's word works. As you get to a portion, you think, well, I'll skip over this one or that one. Suddenly, God has a word for you right there in the midst of it. So whether we'll do psalm four next week or not, I'm not sure at this time, but... Uh, Psalm 3 just spoke right in the midst of all that we are experiencing during these days of uncertainty where we feel like so many things are working against us as individuals, as families, on your job. This coronavirus just seems to really be uh, making life difficult for people, even those who don't seem to be overly concerned about it. Uh, they're living in a world that is very much concerned about it. I was in Birmingham Friday, went down to see uh, my son and his family. And I mentioned going to Walmart just to run by. And he told me that if I did not have a mask, they were not letting me in Walmart. There are many of the stores in Birmingham that they will just not let you in. And by the way, many of the stores are not open. But of those that are open in certain areas of our state and our country, they simply will not let you in uh, without a mask. Now, I'm not one of those that is treating this lightly. Matter of fact, I have worn masks in various places. But it, the world in which we live is greatly affected by this COVID-19. And Psalm 3 
speaks to those that are being affected by a global situation. Psalm 3 uh, has a title. It is the first psalm. Psalm 1 does not have a title. Psalm 2 does not have a title, a title, but Psalm 3 actually starts with a title. If you were reading a Hebrew Bible, uh, you would find that Psalm 3 actually begins with verse 1, which is what we have as the title. And it just says that it's a Psalm of David when he fled from his son, uh, son Absalom. Now, I would encourage you as you think about this Psalm and as you, if if you'll spend some time reading this psalm, I would encourage you to go back and read 2 Samuel chapter 15 and chapter 16. 2 Samuel chapter 15 and chapter 16. Those two chapters sort of give you the story of when David fled from Absalom. Now, two things I want to say to you uh, before we actually get into the psalm. First of all, one thing you need to know about David is he is a friend of God. The New Testament will tell us he is a man after God's own heart. And you see that in this psalm. One of the things that stands so proud is the great confidence that David has in his God. He has overwhelming number of people that is against him. And yet he has great confidence in the Lord his God. Alan Ross, who writes a great commentary on this, said that David understood his relationship with God, number one, by experience, and number two, by revelation. The experience that he had was just daily living and walking with God. And uh, you'll see as we sort of talk a little bit tonight, that David had had so many experiences that he gave to God. He, he understood his relationship with God by experience, but he also understood his relationship with God by revelation. Things that he had been taught concerning the Word of God. Uh, Greg Chapman is about to do a study through experiencing God, and he's going to talk to us about this issue of how do we experience God. A great study from Henry Blackaby and Dr. Chapman uh, is a great teacher, and I would encourage you, uh, if you'd like to be a part of a Zoom Bible study, that would really be one that you need to check out and be a part of, if at all possible. You will, you will really come to know God, especially in these days when so much seems to be against us as we work through that study together. That's the first thing I want you to know about David. David really had a great relationship with God. He was a friend of God. In 1 Samuel chapter 17, one of the earlier times when we come to know about David, you remember that uh, David's brothers uh, had gone to fight in the battle and uh, David's dad looked at him and said, I need you to carry some bread to your brothers. And so he took off to find his brothers. And when he found them, they were kind of locked into a battle with the Philistines. And there was a giant out on the battlefield that was mocking and taunting the armies of God. And uh, David just didn't understand that. But the more he mocked David's God the more David just could not tolerate it. And finally, he said, listen, I'll go out there. I'll fight that giant. And uh, David uh, became a hero that day. Matter of fact, it became a kind of a chant. David, uh, Saul had killed his thousands, but David killed tens of thousands. Now, that doesn't mean that Saul was limited in what he could do, but it does mean that people began to look at David as a great, mighty warrior. And so we see David was one who truly became a great friend of God. He loved God. He wanted to stand for the things of God. And especially he did not want anybody mocking his God. The second thing that I would point out to you about David before we get into this psalm is that David loved his son Absalom. 
When you go back and read 2 Samuel 15 and 2 Samuel 16, what you'll find there is that Absalom had just become uh, overwhelmed with anxiety. There had been a family rift. Uh, David had a son named Amnon and a son named Absalom. But he also had a daughter named Tamar. Now Amnon and Tamar were brothers and sisters, but they had different moms. So Amnon did not think about family relationships in the way that we did. He actually fell in love with Tamar. Ultimately, there came a day when he raped Tamar. And Absalom and Tamar were brother and sister. And after Amnon had raped Tamar, Absalom vowed that he would get him. And David separated the two, made it where they couldn't have this dispute among them. But Absalom found a way, and ultimately he did kill Amnon. Well, that led to tension between David and Absalom. And, uh, of course, David exiled him, and that made things worse. And Absalom worked his way back in. But ultimately, when you get to 2 Samuel 15 and 2 Samuel 16... You find where Absalom has just totally revolted, rebelled against his father, David. And he actually vowed that he would take over the kingdom. And that's what has happened. David has fled from Jerusalem. And Absalom has sort of adorned himself as the king, made himself king of Israel. Now, David has fled Jerusalem. And as he flees, he writes these words. O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many rise up against me. Many are saying of me, God will not deliver him. We see the word many there three times. And I've told you that that is the uh, ultimate in the Hebrew emphasis on this passage. It is... It is a way of describing David is overwhelmed by how many people are after him. But the part that frustrates David is the fact that they are mocking his God. He cannot stand that. And so uh, David begins to cry out to God. Now, one of the things I would point out to you, and you need to understand about yourself, is that when people want to get after you, the first thing they will begin to sort of take shots at is your faith. Where is your confidence in God? They believe, David's enemy, they believe that if they can destroy David's faith in God, they will be able to destroy him. Now, I need to tell you that you have an enemy in this world the New Testament calls him Satan or the devil, uh, but he's after you. And one of the things he wants to do is take down any way he can your faith, your confidence in God. You are always under attack. Paul would say in Galatians 5, verse number 17, that our sinful nature wants to do one thing, and our spiritual nature, that part of us which God has control of, wants to do something else. And then he says, these two are contrary to each other, and you will never be free from the conflict from within. So I would challenge you that from time to time, you just need to ask yourself, what is going on in my life that is challenging the confidence that I have in God? And then reassure yourself that you truly have Great confidence in God. Now, after David announces that he has all these enemies, O oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many rise up against me. Many are saying of me, God will never deliver him. Then the Bible has that little interesting word, Salah. The word Salah just means to stop. It means to ponder. It means pause. Give thought to what's being said. There are many people that are after David, and they're mocking him. They are attacking his confidence in God. And I would tell you that during this coronavirus, there are all kind of things that would not really attack 
uh, God straight on, but they will work in your heart to begin to challenge your confidence that you have in God. And I don't know what you have your confidence. I don't know what has built your confidence in God. But uh, folks, I want to tell you, walking with God for several years, I just look back and see that there are all kinds of things that God has helped me through. I've been to the funeral home on countless occasions. And people have said to me, you know, people that don't have God, I don't see how they make it through times like these. If we were to stop and think about all the times that we could say that, those dark nights when we thought, oh, there's no way I can manage through this. But God always keeps us strong. God keeps right on walking with us. Even though some of us still struggle with loss, some of us still struggle with hard times, some struggle with issues like depression, some struggle with just life. Sometimes life can be hard. And I know some of you have a great struggle that you may be facing even right now. But I would encourage you to shore up your confidence in God. Make sure that you are trusting God every step of the way. And just remind yourself over and over again that yes, you can put your confidence in God. Notice if you would that David cries aloud in verse number 3. But you are a shield around me, O God. You bestow glory on me, and you lift up my head. To the Lord I cry aloud, he says, and he answers me from his holy hill. There is a deep confidence that David has. Even though enemies are surrounding him, it looks as though he's outnumbered. It looks as though there's no hope. There's no way he can make it through this. David has confidence that God is going to answer his prayer from his holy hill. And then you begin to see this confidence lived out in the life that David lives. I will lay down and sleep. I will wake again because the Lord sustains me. You ever had one of those nights when you couldn't sleep because your soul was troubled? Well, David would say he would lay down in confidence, put his trust in God, And God would see him through. He would lay down at night and sleep, knowing that God was going to wake him up and sustain him. Uh, Verse number six, I will not fear the tens of thousands drawn against me on every side. David realizes that he can't even begin to number the people that are against him. And we really don't know that there was tens of thousands of people. But Absalom had coerced the people in turning against David And now David feels that there's enemies surrounding him. Everywhere he looks, there is another enemy, but his confidence is still in God. Verse number seven, arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God. Strike all my enemies on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. You know, in boxing, they say there's a a spot on the chin that if you can ever hit that spot, it will jar the head so severely that you can actually knock a person out. Well, David is not thinking about knocking a person out. David, as far as I know, never took up boxing. He didn't know about all these things. But he knew if, if, if you could hit your enemy hard enough in the chin to break their teeth, uh, you were going to do a lot of damage to your enemy. Well, David knew that that's what God needed to do to his enemy. Arise, O Lord, deliver me, O my God. Strike my enemy on the jaw. Break the teeth of the wicked. David has confidence that with just one strike from the Lord's hand, his enemy will be gone. Verse number eight, from the Lord comes deliverance. May your blessings be on all of your people. Then we have the third and the final Salah. Now let's think just a moment. I passed over the second one without mentioning it. But basically we have David talking about his enemy and he says, stop and think about it. And then in the second verse, David gives us this idea that he can cry out to God and that God will answer. And then he stops again and he says, Salah, stop and think about that. We have this enemy, they're everywhere. Stop and think about it. 
And then we have a God that will answer our prayers. Stop and think about that. And then as he gets down at the end of verse number 8, he knows that God's desire is that he desires to bless his people. And he says, stop and think about that. I hope in the midst of this coronavirus that you'll stop and think about the power of your God that he can defeat any obstacle, any enemy that comes against us, he can give us victory. It's much like what Paul said over in Romans chapter 8. Let me just read to you several verses from Romans chapter 8. Verse number 28, Paul says, And we know that all things God works for good for those that love him who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. And those he called, he also justified. And those he justified, he also glorified. And then listen to verse 31. What then shall we say in response to this? He's talking about all the difficulties. He's going to mention them here in just a moment. But he says, if God is for us, who can be against us? If God is on my side, why do I need to worry about the enemy at all? Remember now, he started this little passage by saying that God's going to work all things out for good to those that love him. Doesn't mean everything is good. Doesn't mean that everything is going to seem good. But God is working, and the end result is going to be good. I was talking to our new director of missions today, and we were talking about Henry Blackaby and the study that we're about to do here at our church. And he reminded me of the singer that travels with Henry Blackaby. And it made me remember one of the songs that this guy sings. And I don't remember his name at this moment. But the song is about a tea bag. And the song simply says that a tea bag doesn't release its flavor until you put that tea bag in hot water. Sometimes we find ourselves in hot water. And we wonder, why in the world would God let me be put in hot water? Well, that guy's song tells us sometimes what the purpose is. God has flavor deep down inside of us. And it's his way of letting the world see, letting the world sort of taste the goodness of God that he's placed inside of us. And sometimes it's nothing more than his grace that is always sufficient, that sees us through some of those dark, terrible times of our life. But that flavor is not released until we are immersed in hot water. Now, Paul is asking the question, if God is for us, who can be against us? Now, I know many of you are thinking, well, what about this or what about that? What about the other? But the truth of the matter is, it doesn't matter what your enemy is or who your enemy is. If God is for you, they're not big enough to do anything to you. God will always see you through. As Paul continues, he said, who would, uh, he would not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. God loves you so much that he gave his one and only son. And since he has done this, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who is justified. Who is he that condemns? Christ Jesus died. More than that, he was raised to life and is at the right hand of God and he's interceding for us. You ever think about that? Right in the middle of this coronavirus, the Lord Jesus Christ right now is praying for you. I mean, it's wonderful when people call me and say, Preacher, I love you. I'm praying for you. Those words lift my heart. But do you know that Jesus is always interceding for you? Did you know that the Holy Spirit is pleading for you right now? 
He knows how to pray in ways that we can't, what Scripture says. But right now, Jesus is interceding for you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble? Shall hardship? Persecution? Famine? Nakedness? Danger? Sword? As it is written, for your sake, we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep led to the slaughter. But then he says, no, N nothing. Hardship, no. Persecution, no. Famine, no. Nakedness, no. Danger, no. Sword, no. Coronavirus, pandemic, social isolation, being locked down in certain places. Are these things going to separate us from the love of Christ? Paul's answer is no, an emphatic no. And I wish I could place it in your heart to come to grips with that fact that there is nothing can separate us from the love of Christ. Listen to these words as Paul closes. In all things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Through Jesus Christ, we have the victory. We are not victorious. We are more than just victory. We have a great God who loves us, who cares for us, and he's going to see us through. Today, I would encourage you, if your confidence in God is just getting a little weak, whatever you need to do, remind yourself of all those times God has seen you through. And just remember that verse and say it over and over again. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you tonight for this time together and for the Bible study of Psalm chapter 3. Thank you for David and the confidence he had in you. And I pray that his words will stir confidence in our heart as well. Father, bless this time. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.